Good morning. Welcome members of Jesus Church and guests who are all created in God's image by our Creator God to the New Life Minister Center. God's kingdom includes those in heaven and the church on earth. We humans are wanted by our Creator. You ever think of that? He's for us. He wants us. He wants us to know Him. Who the Father? He keeps pursuing us. The Father sent the Son to get us by redeeming us. The Spirit actively looks for us, seeking us out to save us. All human beings, all seven billion of us. In the future, Jesus will present the church to himself with great joy. Another thought. After all the trouble we cause him, he's going to present us to himself with great joy. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Let's read it together. I'm not so much worried about the husband's part. I'm thinking more of the second two-thirds of it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ, Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, Ezekiel 34, 15 to 16a, I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which is broken, and will strengthen that which is sick. for centuries. What, what a blessing God is. Let's, let's crown him. Let's sing. Let's crown him with me. Stop my run. 
Through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God. Safety of Human Life 
Sunday. And so as we go to prayer, we're just going to uh, take a moment and pray for that. Um, so let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we, we praise you as the God who is the, the giver and the creator of life. Lord, there is no one like you. And Lord, we thank you for the, the gift of life that you've given to each one of us here. And so this morning, Lord, we want to lift up the unborn and pray for your protection on every child in the womb, Lord. We pray for pray for you to work in hearts across this nation. Lord, it is amazing. It is such an amazing thing that you are the one who knits us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so, Lord, we ask that you would move in the hearts of people throughout this land to protect the unborn. Father, we, we look to you. You're the only one who can do that, ultimately. And so, Lord, we would ask that you would help the people of this land to see the value of every human life and to act in a way in accord with that truth that every one of us, from the unborn to the very aged, are created in your image. Father, this morning we thank you so much that you are the one who pursues us, as John shared with us earlier, Lord. What an amazing God that, that you would send your Son to pursue us through his death and resurrection, that you would send your Spirit to pursue us by working in our hearts. Thank you that you are a God who wants us and who desires us to be your children. Oh, Lord, we don't deserve this, and yet you are so incredibly gracious. And so we just give you thanks, Father, and we pray that we might respond with wholehearted love towards you, Lord, that we might praise you, that we might worship you, that we might be drawn to you, Lord, as you pursue us. May we respond, Lord, with all of our hearts to just seek your holy face. Father, this morning we want to lift up Anya, Hannah, and Manuel Garcia. We thank you so much for their ministry in Peru. And Lord, we pray for your protection over them, for your protection of their ministry. Lord, we ask that you would just keep them in your loving hands and that they would know your gracious presence in their lives as they seek to glorify you. Father, we lift up our brother Ed Berger to you this morning as he seems to be in his final hours now, Lord. We just ask that you would be especially gracious to him, that you would give him your peace and your comfort as you bring him to home to glory. And we pray for Irene and for all of the Burkhart's family, that you would comfort them even now and in the coming days, Lord. We're just going to need your grace and your comfort and your presence in a special way. And so we ask that you would do that for them, and that we might be an encouragement to them in the days ahead, Lord. Father, we thank you for our brother Will, and that you brought him uh, safely through the, the challenges with his heart that he's faced uh, in these last few weeks. We pray for your continued healing for him. We pray for healing for Don, Colton Beetle, for Larry Bates, and Lord, for all in our church family that are that are suffering with illness, we ask for your, your healing touch. And then, Lord, we just um, we just thank you so much for this church family and that you love us with, with just an indescribable love. And so we pray that that love would overflow in our hearts and in our heart, in our lives to one another. Father, we would ask of you that you would make us to increase and to abound in love for one another and for all so that you may establish our hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. And so, Lord, may we be a church that is truly increasing and abounding in love. And so we thank you, Lord. May you be exalted and glorified as we continue to worship you this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few announcements as we get started this morning. First of all, if you're visiting with us today, we want to extend a special welcome to you and and we would love it if you would just take a moment to um, fill out the, the um, tear-off portion of your bulletin and then put that in the offering as it goes by today. It's just a way for us to get to know you a little bit more. A few things coming up. First of all, this summer, Daniel and Elizabeth Baxter are planning on heading up a trip to Peru for about 10 days in July. And so if you are at all interested in joining them on that mission trip, would you um, talk to them or send Elizabeth an email? Um, they would love to, to um, just talk with you and get you included on that team. Coming up on Tuesday night, we're, we are going to have our first worship jam night. Um, we want to do this every Tuesday night, or excuse me, the last Tuesday night of each month. Um, and so uh, you can put that on your calendar. It's going to be at 7 p.m. We're going to have a short uh, devotion just about worshiping God and song, and then just play and play music and sing and honor our, our team together and go for 
don't know, an hour, hour and a half maybe. Should be a, just a, a sweet time to worship the Lord together. So everyone's invited to come up to that. Just kind of an informal time to worship the Lord. Coming up at the end of February, we are going to have our winter mini VBS. It's going to be Friday night the 28th and Saturday morning the 29th. Um, we had an extra day this year, so why not have VBS that day, right? February 29th. So um, there are a couple links in your bulletin, and you should have gotten these also in the email that was sent out. Um, th there's a link where you can sign up your kids to participate on that weekend, and also there's a link for signing up for bringing things, um, food and other things that are needed uh, for that weekend. Also for our Awana ministry on Wednesday nights, we need... Um, we would love to find one more volunteer to help, either with games, leading the games, or um, someone to help out with the uh, kindergarten through second grade class and, and being a leader and teaching that class. So if you're interested in helping in either one of those positions, would you talk to Elizabeth Baxter? And um, she would love to get you involved in helping um, with the kids on Wednesday nights. Um, Zion Evangelical and Reformed Church over across town is going to be hosting a women's conference. Uh, February 21st and 22nd. It's the Revive Our Hearts Conference, which we hosted here uh, when it was live back in the, in the fall. I think that was at the end of September. Um, they are just, they are going to be doing that very same conference just um, several months later, playing those same videos um, coming up February 21st and 22nd. And so they wanted to just invite all the ladies in the community. If you missed the one here, or if you really enjoyed it and want to do it again, um, you're all welcome to go and join them for that. So there are brochures, um, little postcards on the table in the back, and ladies, if you're interested, you can um, you can be part of that. Be part of that. Um, also, uh, if you would like to be uh, to be able to receive the text messages about church cancellations, if you, if you didn't get the text message last Sunday morning, um, there's a uh, there's a note there in your bulletin about how you can sign up to get those messages from the church about cancellations. Um, I think that's it for announcements this morning. Let me invite up John Howe. Oh, I'm just going to share a, a quick announcement with us as well. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a kind of an impromptu fundraiser for Brianna. Uh, she's going to be going to Jamaica uh, on a mission trip. Um, she loved, She wanted to be here today. We had our snow day last Sunday, so we didn't meet. So this is kind of more formal. We're trying to make this a, a more meaningful send-off than just to do a little haphazard fundraising. She's going to Jamaica. She's not going to resorts on the Jamaica coast. She's going to the interior. If any of you been on the interior of any of the uh, Caribbean islands, you'll know it's very different than on the coast. And uh, this is what uh, Brianna has felt, feel, felt led to do. She goes to a really good church there. And if anyone was at the uh, uh, annual meeting we had here just a couple of weeks ago, Todd shared that roughly 80% of all our kids walk away from the church when they leave home. Not good statistics. So anytime someone really feels uh, led to go on a mission trip to attend church, to continue in uh, being ministered by the gospel, uh, we want to be an encouragement to them. There's a little bit of a problem, though, on the mission team. We, uh, like the rest of the church, when we dropped our budget, we lost some funding for our missionaries. We had to cut every one of them $40. We're asking to be, that to be restored. But at the same time, we no longer have any discretionary funds to help pay for and what we do is we take 10% of the trip and we give that towards anyone that goes on a first-time mission trip somewhere. We can't do that. So I'm appealing to this group to help uh, Brianna get to Jamaica. She has roughly $600 uh, left to fund. Has to come in by the 6th of February. Is that right? 6th of February. Uh, she's at, like I said, she's at a meeting right now at her church about this mission trip. Otherwise, she'd be here. This, uh, we were hoping to have this done last, uh, last week. So at any rate, um, again, most of us will never see anything but the coast of the Caribbean islands. Missionary, mission teams go into the interior of all of them. And if you've ever driven by from the airport to the resort, you know just how much poverty there is in these places in the Caribbean and Central America and uh, around the world. So 
I'd like this to be an encouragement to Brianna. Again, she needs roughly 600. There is a uh, basket in the back of the room. I'll be there after the, uh, the service. And she has skin in the game. She's making some scrunchies. Hair scrunchies. Uh, hair scrunchies to, to fundraise. And she also is using her own money to try and get there because she feels led to go. And just as a footnote, for those of you that uh, Patty just mentioned about the trip to Peru, I would strongly encourage you to pray about it because it is an awesome trip to go on these mission trips and see what God's doing around the world. Thank you, John. If you would like to write a check to help support Brianna, you can write it directly to Brianna Billings, or you can write it to Nazareth Lutheran Church. So, um, just one personal thing I should mention. I am uh, just on round two of stomach flu for this week. <laughs> round one came Monday night, round two came yesterday morning. And so I will not shake your hand this morning, <laughs> because I love you. <laughs> Thank you. So please don't be offended when I don't shake your hand uh, this morning. Um, with that said, the rest of you can stay on and shake hands with me. <laughs>
able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. We will continue to worship our great God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. can be dismissed for children's church that are three years old through kindergarten. And let's stand right now for the reading of God's word. We're just going to read the sweet spider verse, which is Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4. Um, last week we missed the first two verses, but <coughs> those four weeks, if you memorize um, just two verses a week, you can memorize this entire psalm. So it's really a great psalm. So let's read these verses. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And then this morning's sermon text is Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside asking to speak to you. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray together. Oh Lord Jesus, this is such an amazing passage. What you say to us here about who we are in you is just absolutely amazing. And so thank you that you have called us to be members of your family, and I, I pray that as we look into this text now that we would really grasp hold of that, and that you would help us to live together as your family, loving one another, loving you, Lord Jesus. And so, would you speak to us now through your word? Would you help me be my strength and my weakness, Lord? Speak to each one of our hearts, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. <coughs> This morning we are beginning a new sermon series. We are going to spend five weeks looking at God's calling to the church. Over the next few weeks, we're going to try to answer questions like, what is the church? And how important is the church in God's plan? How important should the church be to us? How is the church supposed to function? What are our responsibilities as members of the church? These are very important questions, and we need to be able to answer them biblically and correctly if we're going to be able to glorify God together and to be a healthy church. And I think that a, a good place for us to begin is by just thinking about our identity as a church. Before we talk about what we should do, we need to know who we are. And so here in Matthew 12... Jesus is going to tell us about our identity. He's going to define the church, and he's going to do it really in a surprising way. He's going to tell us that the church fundamentally is a family, and specifically the church is his family. 
The church is not a business. It's not primarily an organization or an institution. You can't feel at home in an institution. But you can feel at home in a family. And that's what the church is. And so this morning, what we're going to do is going to take, we're going to take time to unpack this text so that we can understand what Jesus is teaching here about his family. And then after we go through the text and look at a couple of implications in the rest of the New Testament, then we're going to think about seven implications, seven practical implications for us as a church about what it means to be Jesus' family. So let me begin by setting the stage here. In Matthew 12, Jesus is teaching in a house. It's probably a large house because his disciples are there and some scribes and Pharisees are there and evidently there are some other people that are there. And in the verses leading up to this text, Jesus is basically making the claim that whether or not you're in God's kingdom depends on how you respond to him. If you reject him like the scribes and Pharisees, then you are out of God's kingdom. If you trust him, follow him as a disciple, then you are in God's kingdom. And so then in verse 46, it says, While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside, asking to speak to him. Now, after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had other sons and daughters. According to Mark 6.3, Jesus had at least four other brothers. He had at least two sisters. And so now Mary and the brothers of Jesus are standing outside of this house, and they want to they take a moment and speak to Jesus. Now, if, you, if, if you're using the English Standard Version, like, like I'm using, you are missing verse 47. And you have a footnote there that says, someone, that some manuscripts insert verse 47. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside asking to speak to you. Now, if you're using a different English version, you probably have 47 in your text. And so there's, a, there's an issue here with the manuscripts. Remember that the Bible was copied by hand until the printing press was invented in the 15th century. And some of the ancient manuscripts have verse 47, and some of them don't have verse 47. I think that what happened is that at some point early on, there was a scribe who accidentally skipped over verse 47. And you can ask me the details about that later if you're interested. I don't want to get into the weeds here. But all that is to say that I believe that Matthew actually wrote verse 47. I think that it should be included here in the text, and so I'm going to treat it here as part of the text. So, in verse 47, someone's telling Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside, Jesus. They want to have a word with you. They want to speak to you. And so what would you expect Jesus to do here? You would expect him to say, excuse me a moment, I need to go outside and talk to my family. Let's take a break from the teaching. Everyone go get a drink of water, and we'll start up again in 15 minutes. You would expect Jesus to do that. Because in the world of the New Testament, a person's most important relationships were with his family, particularly his biological family. In fact, for Jewish men in the first century, their closest relationships were typically not with their wives or with their children, but with their brothers. That's just the way that it was in that culture. And so when Jesus hears that his mother and his brothers are outside, the way that he responds in verses 48 through 50 is shocking. Now, it's not shocking because Jesus didn't talk with them. In fact, in the next verse, the first verse of chapter 13, it says that Jesus went out of the house and went down by the sea to teach. I would guess that as soon as Jesus walked out the door, he had a conversation with Mary and his brothers. The text doesn't tell us, but that's probably what happened. Now, verses 48 through 50 are shocking because what Jesus is going to do is he's going to redefine his family here. He's going to say that his followers are actually more important to him. They have a closer connection to him than his natural family. That is unbelievably countercultural and shocking. And so, in verses 48 through 50, Jesus replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so, when you become a disciple of Jesus, you become a member of his family. You become his brother or sister or his mother. Now, for those of us on this side of the cross, that means that if you're trusting in Jesus as your Savior, that he died and rose for the forgiveness of your sins, 
then Jesus claims you as part of his family. Like John mentioned earlier, Jesus came to pursue us, and he's claimed us to be part of his family. And you are more closely related to Jesus than even Mary and his, and his brothers and his sisters who grew up in the same house with him. That truth has got huge implications for us as individuals and as a church. And so first of all, for us as individuals, we have an amazingly close relationship with Jesus. Jesus is not your fourth cousin twice removed. He's your brother. And Hebrews 2 says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He loves you as his brother or his sister. He's very glad to have you as part of his family. And Jesus is not like some older siblings who look down on their younger siblings and are embarrassed of them. No, Jesus is the perfect elder brother. He loves, to, he loves to spend time with you. He is the perfect role model to look up to. He is everything you could ever want in a big brother. And besides that, I want you to notice in verse 50 that, that Jesus speaks about God the Father as my Father in heaven. So think about the implication of that. If the Father is Jesus' Father, and we are Jesus' brothers and sisters, then that means that we are children of God, that God is our Father in heaven. When you become a disciple of Jesus through faith in Him, you become a child of God. As the Apostle Paul taught, we've been adopted by God through faith in Jesus so that we can know God as our very own Father. He's given us His Spirit to come into our hearts and cry out, Abba, Father. And so when you put all this together, what you see is that if Jesus is my brother and your brother, and God is your father and my father, then we are brothers and sisters in the same family. Last week, Carlin's two youngest brothers spent a few days with us. Most of you know that Carlin's parents adopted four boys uh, almost ten years ago. And now the oldest is 16 and the youngest is 11. And even though these boys are just a little bit older than my kids, they have the same parents as Carlin. And so Carlin and her three biological siblings and her four adopted brothers are all part of the same family. <laughs> They're all brothers and sisters. They, they all have the same parents. And that's exactly how it is in Jesus' family. All of us have the same father. We all have the same elder brother. And so all of us that are believers are brothers and sisters in one family. And so Jesus is teaching us here that his family, that he has a family that's more important to him than even Mary and his brothers, and all of Jesus' disciples together make up Jesus in Jesus' first family. We are his first and most important family. Now, I think that it's easy to see how this relates to the church. When Jesus was on earth, of course, his disciples followed him around and listened to his teaching. But after he rose from the dead in the book of Acts, what did Jesus' family members do? Well, they started to gather together in churches to worship Jesus. And as the gospel spread and more people became followers, followers of Jesus, they were added to the church. And so how did the New Testament Christians think about the church? They thought about the church as a family. This is what Jesus taught them. And this, is, this, is, this was their mindset. And you find this everywhere in the New Testament. I think that it's really easy to miss this, and to miss how important this is. Not because we only find it a few places in the New Testament, but because we find it everywhere in the New Testament. We can, be so, we can become so familiar with this that we, that we actually miss the obvious. And so imagine with me for a moment, if you were at a friend's house for supper, and suddenly, as you're eating dinner, you feel like there's an earthquake. And the walls are shaking, the dishes on the table are rattling, and you're hearing this loud rumble, and so you say to your friend that are hosting you, what's that? And they say, what's what? And they say, don't you hear that? No, I don't, I don't hear anything. And that shaking, that, it's like an earthquake. Oh, oh, you mean the train? Oh yeah, there's train tracks 20 feet behind our house, and the train goes through two or three times a day. I guess I've become so used to it that I don't, that I don't even notice it anymore. 
The idea of the church as a family is like a tree in the backyard. <laughs> it is so pervasive, it's almost on every page in the book of Acts and in almost every one of the epistles. So it's easy to not even notice it, just like the people who don't even notice the tree in the backyard. And so let me ask you a question. How many times would you guess the New Testament uses the word brother to refer to Christians? Would you say maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe even 50? It's actually about 225 times. <laughs> That's how common it, is, common it is in the New Testament for Christians to be called brothers or sisters. I think it's found, I think this idea of Christians being brothers or sisters is found in every one of the epistles except for 2, P, uh, 2 John and Jude. So these tiny little uh, one chapter books are the only one, maybe Titus too. But almost every epistle in the New Testament talks about Christians being brothers and sisters. Here's another way to think about it. In the world of the New Testament, the most common way to refer to a family was as a household. And both Paul and Peter refer to the church as the household of God, that is the family of God. For example, 1 Timothy 3.15 talks about the household of God, which is the church of the living God. And so the church is a family. The church is God's household, his family. There are a number of other ways that the church, uh, that the New Testament refers to the church as a family. For example, 1 Peter twice uses the word brotherhood to refer to Christians. 1 Peter 2.17 says that we should love the brotherhood. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. In other, words, in other words, love one another as brothers, because that's what you are. You are brothers and sisters, so love one another like that. And so, this is how the New Testament church thought about itself, as a family. And as we've seen this morning in Matthew 12, Christians didn't come up with this on their own. They got it from Jesus himself. They got it from the Master. The New Testament church understood its identity as a family because this is exactly what Jesus taught his first disciples in that house in Galilee in Matthew chapter 12. And so what is the church? Fundamentally, who are we? We are a family. The family of Jesus himself. The family created by the gospel. When you believe in the gospel, you're not only saved from your sin, but you're also brought into this family called the church. And in this wonderful family, God is our Father, Jesus is our elder brother, and we are all brothers and sisters. <coughs> and so then, we need to ask this question. What does it mean for the church to function together as a family, as a healthy family? <laughs> the reality is, we don't get to choose whether or not we want to be a family. We, we are. This is, this is the truth. And so, if this is our identity, how can we live in accord with this identity? Very practically, how can we, as brothers and sisters, live in a way that, our, that, that pleases our Father? In our own homes, when the Father gets home from work at the end of the day and he walks in the door, if he walks in and finds the kids are bickering and fighting with one another, he's not going to be very happy about that. But if he gets home and the, and the children are getting along, they're, they're playing together, they're having fun together, he's going to be very pleased about that. I'm really thankful that our Heavenly Father is much more patient than we are. He is a far more patient father than I am. But as his beloved children, we want to please our Heavenly Father, don't we? And so, as a church family, how can we please our Heavenly Father? How can we please our elder brother Jesus? What I want to do for the rest of the time now this morning is point out seven specific ways that we can please the Lord. Seven very practical ways that we can live out our identity as the family of Jesus. So first of all, we need to realize that our relationships in the church are extremely important. Extremely important. You don't treat your brothers and sisters in the same way that you treat strangers. In fact, you don't relate to your brothers and sisters in the same way that you relate to even your acquaintances or your neighbors. You have a special relationship with your siblings. And that's the way that our relationships in the church should be. Not only with the people that we're close friends with, but really with everyone in the church. Now I realize you're not going to be best friends with 150 people, but we should see one another as family and think of one another with that mindset. And so the second implication then is that we're called to love one another as brothers and sisters. As Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. 
affection. It almost goes without saying that the brothers and sisters in the family should love one another. And think about what Jesus taught his disciples. What are the main things that Jesus taught his disciples to do? He taught them to love God and to love one another. Remember at the end of John 13, as Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, the night before he was crucified, he said to them, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. When you read John's epistles, you see that John really took that to heart. And he continually exhorted the church through our first John, second John, third John to love one another. In fact, there's a story from the early church about the Apostle John. Um, it's not in the Bible, but it was written by, by, by some author in the early second century um, who probably knew John personally. And this, as the story goes, when John was very elderly, he would be carried into church. And as he was being carried into church, every time that they met together, he would be saying, Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. And when someone asked him, John, why do, you, why do you always say love one another? He replied, because if you do this, it is enough. John himself wrote in 1 John 3.16 that we should love our brothers in the same way that Jesus has loved us. He wrote, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He's saying, you are brothers and sisters, you're family. And so, love one another with a Christ-like love, with a lay-your-life-down kind of love. That's not a superficial kind of love. That's a deep, committed, sacrificial love. This is the kind of love that makes us willing to make sacrifices for one another. The kind of love that helps us put the needs and the interests of others above our own needs and our own interests. And so then the third implication, I think, flows out of the first two. If, if our relationships in the, in the church family are extremely important, and if we're called to love one another with a Christ-like love, then we should be unified. We should be at peace with one another. In any family, you would expect that now and then, there are going to be conflicts. There are going to be disagreements. Every one of our families has a conflict now and then. This is not unusual. Some families, more, it's more common than others, but... But it's not unusual, it's not surprising when your family has a, a disagreement or a conflict. And the same is really true for the family of God, isn't it? On this side of heaven? <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised when there are conflicts in the church. This is normal, this is not unusual, this is part of family life. In fact, the Apostle Paul expected that people in the church were going to offend one another, and that the church was going to experience conflict. In Colossians 3.13, Paul wrote that we should bear with one another and that we should forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven us. Now think about that. You don't need to bear with people when you get along with them perfectly. You only have to bear with people who bother you. <laughs> you only need to forgive people who offend you. And so Paul is saying here, when conflicts arise in the church, not if they arise, but when they arise, bear with one another. Be patient. Love one another. Forgive one another. Be reconciled. In fact, if we go back to the book of Matthew and just back up a few chapters to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that being reconciled to your brother is so important that you should pursue reconciliation before you come to worship God. Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, so, so if, you're, if you're at the temple in Jerusalem to worship, you're bringing an offering to sacrifice to the Lord, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And so if you think about that, it is incredibly important for us as a family to live in unity with one another, and when we're not in unity, to pursue peace and to be reconciled as quickly as we possibly can. A fourth implication is that the fact that the church is Jesus' family means that 
we need to be highly, highly committed to one another. This just calls us to an incredibly high level of commitment to the church. When your family gets together to celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving, you don't just call up your mom or dad that morning and say, you know what, I decided not to come to Christmas dinner this year. There's a really good show on TV that I want to watch, so I've decided that I'm just going to stay home today and, and watch this show on TV. <laughs> you know, when the family has a celebration like that, everybody comes, unless you have a really good reason not to be there. Like there's a blizzard, or you're sick, or you're serving on the mission field. And really, that's the way that it should be in the church, should it not? <laughs> that when we get together on Sunday mornings, it really is a family celebration. It's just as much a family celebration as Christmas dinner, because we're celebrating what our elder brother has done to save us. And so, why would it not be a priority for us to come to the family celebration? <laughs> now, I realize that there are legitimate reasons to miss Sunday morning. Like you're sick, or you're traveling, or, or you, you have a work schedule that you just have no control over. But because the family is committed to one another, it should be normal for, to, to come to the family celebration. With, an heart, with a heart that's eager to see your brothers and sisters, and to worship Christ together. Fifth, since we're family, we should encourage one another. And, 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 I, want to, and I want to encourage you to get to know the members of the family that you don't know very well yet, so that you can encourage not just a few people, but everybody in the church family. I think that this is a part, a part of what it means for us to love one another. If I love you, I'm not going to be content to just be a stranger, but I'm going to make an effort to get to know you. And the better that we know one another, the better we can love one another and care for one another. The reality is that if I don't know you at all, then I, I really can't meet your needs because I, I don't know what your needs are. I don't know what the challenges mean are. I don't know what you're struggling with. And so, <clears throat> if I have no relationship with you, I really can't do very much to encourage you and to help you. We need to know one another so that we can care for one another, so that we can encourage one another and minister to one another. And so let me challenge you this morning, not only today but in the coming weeks, to look for people in the church that you don't know. And to introduce yourself to them. And, and to find out a little bit about them. Find out their name. Find out a little bit about their family and, and where they work. And if you do that, you might just actually find a new friend. Six. Families have relationships across the generations. And the same should be true for the church. Think again of your extended family's Christmas gathering. There were probably several generations there, and you probably spent time on Christmas talking with some aunts and uncles, so probably spent some time talking with some nieces and nephews, grandparents spent time with grandchildren. The, the intergenerational relationships that you find in a healthy family are beautiful, and they're very important. When those kinds of relationships develop within the church family, that is a beautiful thing, and it's also very, very important. We have a Titus 2 ministry for women here. Because the Word of God instructs the more mature women in the church to teach and to mentor the younger women. If we want our children and our youth to follow Christ, then we need to invest in them. This is not just Pastor Nathan's job. This is all of our responsibility. Every time that we have a child dedication, I ask this question to the congregation. Will you, as members and friends of this church, be faithful to your calling as members of the body of Christ, so that this child and all other children in your midst may grow up in the knowledge and love of the Lord? If we're going to fulfill that commitment, then we need to build relationships with the youth and with the kids. We need to invest in their lives. In fact, even if you don't have any kids in the youth group or any younger children, I want to encourage you that you can still minister to the kids in this church. Most of us can probably think of an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent that made a big impact on our lives. You can become a spiritual grandparent or a spiritual aunt or uncle to one or two or even several kids in this church. So would you pray about the opportunity to do that? Would you ask that the Lord might even use you to invest in the lives of some teenagers or some younger kids? 
And really, with all the kids that we've been blessed with in this church, we have a huge opportunity, as well as a huge responsibility, to invest in the next generation. And then seventh, and finally, a family has common goals that they pursue together. And the same should be true for the church family. I think that those of you who grew up on a farm understand this very well. <laughs> on a farm, the whole family works together to run the farm and to make a living. Everyone has different roles. Dad does something, mom does something, the, the older sons do something, the younger sons do something, the, the, the daughters do something. Everyone has a different role, but they're all working together to produce a crop, to care for the animals, to make it a productive farm. And in the same way, the church family works together for a common goal. We have different roles, and we're going to talk about that next, uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, in 1 Corinthians 12. God has gifted us in different ways, and yet, He's done that. He's given us a diversity of gifts so that we can work together in unity for a common purpose. And so, what is the goal that we should be pursuing as a church? Well, the number one goal, of course, is to glorify God. Like Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And another goal, another really important goal, is to make disciples. As Jesus said in the Great Commission, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so I think that another way that we could say this is that our goal as a family is to glorify our Father and to tell people about our elder brother, Jesus. I think we could even say that our goal as a family involves expanding the family, helping more people to become our brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. And you know what? A healthy family, a healthy home, is attractive. It's very attractive. In Stockholm, Sweden, there is a luxury hotel called Et Hem, which means a home. And they've done everything that, that they can at that hotel to make it feel like a home. When people arrive there, they want, it to, they want people to feel like they're walking into a happy home. And it's an, an incredibly successful hotel. And I'm sure that part of the reason for its success is that there are so many people in this world who don't live in a happy home. So many people who don't have a healthy family. And they're glad to get to go to this hotel and spend a few days in a place that feels like a happy home. The reality is that there are people all around us who are looking for a good home. There are people everywhere around us who are longing to be part of a happy family. And when the church is a healthy, loving family, people are going to want to be part of that. We can minister to the lonely. We can minister to people who have broken families. We can minister to youth who are spiritual orphans. We can minister to these people by the grace of God and be the family that their hearts are longing for. And so, we are a family here at Garden Evangelical Free Church. According to Jesus, this is who we are. This is our identity. And so, let's love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And let's do that for the glory of God and for the sake of the advance of the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, what, a, what an amazing privilege it is that you would actually call us your brothers and sisters. Oh Lord, we don't deserve this at all. We deserve to be cast out, and yet you have brought us into your home. And because of you, Lord Jesus, we can call God our Father. Oh, what an amazing thing it is, Father, to be able to cry out, Abba, Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow more and more into this identity you've given us as your family. May we love one another and be committed to one another. May we be a, a happy and healthy home that's attractive to the world so that we can be the family that, that people need so desperately. And so we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love for us and help us to share that love with one another. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand and to sing with us.
If you'd like to pray with someone this morning, there will be a prayer team here at the front, and they'd love to spend some time with you. If you're able to spend a few minutes just to help us um, clean up chairs for a while this week, we certainly appreciate that too. And um, also just a reminder to stop by and talk to John in the back afterwards. Um, and I just want to encourage you to give as you might feel that to help Brianna go on her mission trip. So let's go now with God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen.